Good evening and welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival virtual session featuring noted author Kevin Brockmeyer and his new book, The Ghost Variations, 100 Stories. I'm your moderator, Susan Pet Petty Moneyhan, and I've got a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. Please mute your microphones on your computer or tablet below and type any questions in the chat section and then I'll moderate the, the, the chats. And one other thing, this book is available at Wordsworth, so you, you'll be able to get it there. Welcome, Kevin. It's so nice to be with you, even virtually. I wanna tell you and our audience how much I enjoyed this book. Stories ranged from profound to profoundly funny. How did you conceive the project? Just decide to write 100 ghost stories one day? Um. Well, uh, you know, I began with the idea of writing a hundred stories. Uh, that that was the genesis for the project. Um, very quickly thereafter, I decided that it would be a hundred ghost stories. Uh, it just seemed to me that if I was going to fill out a collection of that length, uh, I needed to find a subject that I thought would allow me to uh, produce a hundred different conceits. Um, I'm attracted to the idea of ghosts, uh, to the idea of afterlives, plural. Uh, and so I, I was fairly sure that I would be able to complete a collection of this length if I oriented around that theme. How long did it take you? To write the book? Yes. Um, much, much longer than I anticipated it would. Uh, it always so, is. Yes, uh, you know, I always think I'm about to give myself uh, a break. Um, you know, I, I wanted to engage in this book as a kind of play, uh, you know, a sort of very strictly formalized play. Um, and I hope some of that attitude is contained inside the book. But I made the mistake of believing that because I was bringing a playful attitude to it, uh, it would be a breeze to write. And as that turned out very much not to be the case. Uh, so it took me about you know, I think about four years uh, from conception to completion. Um, that said, there were several uh, teaching semesters in the middle of that when I just didn't get any writing done at all. Well, um, you had promised me you were gonna read some of the stories for us. And, you know, I begged you all day for elephants and I have to have a brief little ca caveat why I wanted elephants so much. I adopted an orphaned elephant from the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust and the notion that the recorded voices of dead elephants could affect the living about broke my heart. So let's listen to the six stories you've decided to read. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, elephants will be one of those stories, but it's going to be the last of the six. Uh, so um, a handful of these stories I will have read at previous iterations of the Six Bridges Book Festival. Uh, some of you are here today, uh, have been to those sessions and might've heard me read uh, a couple of these stories before. Uh, some of them will be new and some of them I'm going to arrive at randomly in ways that I'll describe momentarily. Um, but I'd like to begin with a story that I have read at an earlier book festival in Little Rock. Um, uh, as Susan mentioned, this is a collection of 100 ghost stories, uh, very broadly defined. A uh, few of them are kind of creepy stories with a gotcha ending, which is how one would traditionally think of ghost stories. Um, a handful of them are, and I'll, I'll give you one of those a little bit later. Uh, but this first one is a ghost story of a more sentimental sort. Uh, it's story number 70 in the book, and it's called A Man in a Mirror. That woman in the owl eye glasses leads a life of secrecy and ritual. In the morning before she leaves for work and in the evening before she goes to sleep, she always spends two hours staring into the mirror by her front door, four hours total each and every day without fail. For years, this has been her habit, though not as you might suspect because she loves her own reflection. Her nose roosts too low on her face for one thing. Her chin is too broad and bony. And her freckles, once her best feature, have gone gray along with her hair. 
No, when she addresses the mirror, she does so at an angle, gazing not at herself, but past herself. Some years ago, on her way out the door, she was adjusting the pendant on her necklace when a sudden glassiness of motion caught her eye. At first, she mistook it for a flaw in the mirror's silver. Then the flaw startled her by roping its arms over its head and opening its mouth in a helpless yawn. So recognizably human and yet so obviously immaterial that she knew at once that it, that he, was a ghost. Every day since then, as if by appointment, she has watched the ghost's comings and goings. Only in the small Venetian mirror by the front door does she see him, and even then only occasionally, when his activities happen to intersect with the living room, the hallway, or the outermost edge of her kitchen. Now and then he behaves with what seems to be affection toward what seem to be people, knitting his fingers around as if tying a ribbon in someone's hair, for instance, or rocking back and forth as if embracing someone from behind. From this, she has judged that he has a wife and daughter, though they have never, as he has, taken shape in the silver. Once, nearly a decade ago, Upon a rainy April 8 a.m., he approached the mirror to inspect his teeth. He was channeling a fingernail between his incisors when he accidentally met her eyes. For a few seconds, as his face did something curious, her knees locked and her toes began to tingle. Her heart seemed to beat at the same lazy pace as the world. She realized she was in love. Ever since then, she has been waiting for it to happen again. On the first Saturday of each month, the woman in the owl eye glasses puts on her best silk blouse and her pressed denim skirts and heads out for lunch with her friend, the manicurist, who works in a little shop across the street. Last week, over burgers and fries, she almost told her about the ghost. Instead though, she confessed a different secret altogether. How she fantasizes and often about erasing the past 50 years of her life and starting over again. Awakening as she used to be, a skinny girl with red hair and freckles, whose decisions had not yet been made, whose rituals had not yet been established and who could never imagine that 50 years later, in her loneliness and disappointment, she would long to trade her life away. Are you, her friend asked in a voice of almost unbearable sympathy, seeing someone? Um, the next story I'd like to read uh, is number 98 in the book and it's called Numbers. Um, I've read this one at an earlier festival as well. And the reason I wanted to read it again today is that a few days ago, I got one of the kindest compliments I think I've ever received as a writer. Um, and it was about this story. Uh, I have a friend uh, whose name is Mira. Um, she's now 13, but at a festival a few years ago, she was 10 and she was in the room when I read this story. And she said, mostly she hadn't been paying attention. Um, but something about this one made her ears perk up. And although three years had gone by, um, which is a large percentage of her life, she recounted the story to me and she was able to remember it in detail. And I thought that was most surprising um, and it, it pleased me. Um, so I wanted to reread this story as well. This is numbers. Six billion, four thousand and forty one. 6,004,042, 6,004,043. The boy was still in the cradle when he began hearing the numbers, far too young to recognize them for what they were. To his ears, 
They were just one of the many sounds the world produced, an almost subaudible buzz of enumeration that came and went with the hours, like the hello calls of the birds and the insects, or the bending noises the trees made in the wind. Nature creaked, nature rustled, nature chirped, and nature counted. It was a fact as ordinary as any other. He was halfway through elementary school before it occurred to him that the numbers he was multiplying and dividing in his workbook were like the numbers that had helped him fall asleep at night. He was not stupid, or at least he did not think he was, but until then the similarity had never crossed his mind. The original numbers, the world's numbers as he thought of them, were simply too familiar. All his life he had been conscious of their background presence, their whisperiness, the way they stopped and started and stopped again. For a while, they would proceed sequentially. Then softly, unassumingly, they would break off. After a while, they would recommence, but always at a different point in the series, either much later or much earlier swooping from the high billions to the low thousands and back again. Not until college did the boy realize that not everyone could hear them. One day in the dorm's cafeteria, he noticed that the digits were swiftly approaching a million. 999,994, 999,995. He hushed his friends, said, hold on, are you ready? And then after a few seconds, made a presto motion with his finger. From their expressions, as flat as doors, he understood that they were deaf to the recitation. It was like discovering that he and he alone was aware of the seasons. A million and six, a million and seven, a million and eight. As the boy grew older, he began to sense that each act of counting belonged to a different voice, that he was listening to many distinct and ongoing monologues rather than a single sporadic one. Each voice had its own personality, each personality its own numbers. Maybe he was overhearing the lifetime tally of people's footsteps, maybe some strange cellular background calculation. There were so many possibilities. He always believed he would solve the puzzle before he died. Then he did die, and at first he was none the wiser. He found himself standing in a great landscape of ghosts, epics and epics of them, stretching in all directions. They were locked like pillars into their stances, the ghosts, frozen, exactly where they had expired. What was he supposed to do, he wondered. What did it mean? He was preparing to ask the question when his lips began moving and quietly fixed in his eternal place, he heard himself take up his obligation. One, two, three, four. So, to me, that's one of the most frightening stories in the entire book. Um, it's not a traditional ghost story, but the idea is very creepy. Um, when I'm writing a book, I often have a totem object of one kind or another that I keep on my desk um, from the very first word to the very last. And in the case of this book, it was this object right here. It is... Um, a hundred-sided die called a Zaki Hedron. Uh, it's hollowed out um, and it's filled with grains or beans of some kind. Uh, and that's to keep it from rolling endlessly across the floor like a golf ball. Um, so what I thought I would do for the next story is just roll the die uh, and see what number comes up as a way of just finding a random story in the book. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what the die suggests. All right, this is story number 10. 
It's called The Scales of Fortune. Here in the sidewalk cafe sits a man whose fortunes are in perfect balance. In him, the good and the bad of life, the yin and the yang, equal each other exactly. And not just suppositionally, in a sooner or later sort of way, but immediately and down to the smallest grain. Right now, for instance, he is eating a sandwich so slippery with mayonnaise that three quarters of the lettuce glissated into his mouth on the very first bite. Bad. The tomato, on the other hand, is uncommonly fresh and hearty with the kind of delectably tart sweetness that must have belonged to the very first tomato. The tomato he thinks that gave tomatoes their name. Good. Or a more material example. Last week, the man received a letter containing the news that he had been awarded a prestigious fellowship, complete with a two-year monthly cash stipend. He had just reached the congratulations again portion of the letter when a call came from his bank informing him that someone had drained his checking account. His life had been abundant with such episodes. More than abundant, glutted. He met his teenage girlfriend when she stopped to help him after he was clipped by a car walking home from school. Last spring, he woke from root canal surgery to find that he had won a hard fought election to his condo board. The day his grandfather died, his dog gave birth to four puppies. He was in first grade at the time and had not even lost his baby teeth but already he understood how the formula worked. The world was showing him his grandfather's worth in puppies, apparently four. So you see, the interdependency of adversity and well-being is not a matter of philosophy for the man, much less religious belief, but a matter of direct and ongoing experience. He has never faced a moment when his luck was not keeping measure with itself the good counter-checking the bad and vice versa. As a result, he views his life not as a series of highs and lows, but as a single continuous high-low, sometimes more expansive and sometimes less, but always averaging out at precisely the same level. He welcomes each difficulty with a leap of nervous excitement. With each stroke of luck, he feels a twinge of anticipatory fear. He lives in dread of landing his dream job, falling in love, winning the lottery. Though he does not know it, the perfect balance of his fortunes necessitates the existence of another man, or rather two, one whose life has been only blessings and another complementary, whose life has been only catastrophe. The perfect imbalance of their fortunes balances out the perfect balance of the man's own. On one side of the planet, here in the sidewalk cafe, he sits finishing his sandwich, carelessly dabbing the sauce from his lips, while on the other, in all their excess, live those two contrary men, the first strong and wealthy, radiant with sensual pleasures, and the other, unloved, over-intelligent, swollen with pathogens, haunted by ghosts. So the ghosts made a very, very late appearance in that particular story. Um, the next one I'd also like to arrive at randomly. One of the things I was hoping to do when I toured with this book, little realizing that there would be a pandemic at play, was just... Um, interacting with the audience and asking people if they would mind simply giving me a random number between one and 100. Uh, and so I'm hoping that someone would be willing to do that either in the Q&A box or in the chat box. And uh, I'll look for it. Number 19 from Carol Hodges. Thank you, Carol. Um, all right. So let me close the chat box again. Story number 19 is... called 
an ossuary of trees. The night it occurred to him, he was living inside a corpse, or to be more precise, inside the bones of a hundred corpses, the trees that constituted the timbers of his house, was the same night he stopped sleeping. His daylight troubles were the same as everyone else's, the bills that needed paying, the work that needed doing, the sicknesses that needed nursing. But his nighttime troubles emanated from a different place altogether, the far back marshland of his mind, dense with fevers and perseverations, offering up scenarios as fantastic as nightmares, yet conscious, waking. Like God, what if God was not almighty, he thought, or even particularly effectual, but a loser, an underdog, kind and loving maybe, but outstrengthened by the forces of chaos and suffering? What if this world was simply the best he could do? Or the earthworms, so many of them that beneath the ground, they must nestle together like the folds of a gigantic brain. And what would happen if that brain were suddenly to become conscious? And now the trees and their dry dead bodies. All his life, without thinking, he had allowed himself to be encased in their remains, eaten at his wooden table, walked across his wooden floor, leafed absent-mindedly through his books and his magazines. Blithely, he had filled the hours with their boards all around him. In the daylight, the idea would never have bothered him. But now, as he lay in bed with the moonlight filtering through his blinds, his entire body hummed with apprehension. Suddenly, he could feel the rafters looming above him, the walls bulking around him. And to his vision, there came a swift progression of images the ruinous machines that had severed the trees at their ankles, that had stripped them of their bark, drained them of their sap, and made a door of their ribs. And he, the dumb human specimen, who had stepped unwittingly inside their corpses. What was the word for a house made of bones? A mausoleum, an ossuary. The cavemen had it right, he thought. You should find a hole in some cliffside and cower in it like an animal. That's what you should do. And now a worse thought. What if the trees had ghosts? And what if those ghosts came back for their bodies? It wasn't the first time, bundled under his covers with the lights out, he had sensed that he was not alone. Something in his groin tightened and a pulse of ice ran through his veins as the house settled with a creak against its foundations. So that was one of the frightening stories in the book, which we just landed on by luck. Um, the next one I'd like to read to you, uh, I promised my mom I would read. Uh, she just got her hand on the collection. Susan, do you have a question for me? I did have a question. Okay. One of our audience um, wonders if, if you know of the book, Alan Lightman's Einstein Dreams. I do. And wondered if there was a connection somehow between your, your book and his. Well, I think that's a lovely book. I read it when I was about 19 years old. Um, so, I mean, there is a connection insofar as it's a volume of very short stories that orient themselves toward metaphysics, um, which my book also does. Um, when I was talking with my editor about the book, uh, he specifically mentioned Alan Lightman and Einstein's dreams as um, sort of a marketing model for what we might be able to do with this book. I don't know whether they followed through on that. The marketing decisions aren't really my own, um, but I am definitely aware of that book. Um, however, if you're curious about books that were a more direct inspiration on this one, um, I have a website, uh, it's kevinbrockmeyer.com. And there's one page on that website that is devoted to a long sequence of lists. I'm a dedicated list keeper. 
Um, any of you who know me or have been to any of my previous events will know of my um, the pleasure I take in keeping lists. Uh, and I've begun accumulating and archiving various lists on that website. I am up to number 264 right now. That's how many lists are there. So you'll find a list of my 50 favorite books and 50 favorite albums, uh, you know, along with much more specific lists. Among those are my favorite 10 novels about ghosts, my favorite 10 movies about ghosts, um, and then also uh, my 20 favorite collections of flash fiction or very short fiction. Uh, 10 of them American and 10 of them non-American. Um, so I guess before I dive into the last couple stories, I'll just tell you about a couple of those books. Um, the ghost stories, uh, the novels about ghosts, among those 10, probably my very favorite is a novel by Peter S. Beagle. Um, some of you who live here in Little Rock will have had the chance to hear him read at the Arkansas Literary Festival uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, Beagle's very first novel was called A Fine and Private Place. He wrote it when he was only 19 years old, uh, quite unusually young. I was writing junk when I was 19 years old, frankly. Um, but this book, I think, is an extraordinary beauty that's just filled with heart and imagination and skill. Um, it's never been out of print since 1960 when it was published. Um, and it is about a love affair between two ghosts uh, that takes place when they find themselves waking up in the cemetery where they've been buried. I, it is, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, if you know Peter S. Beagle's name, it's most likely from his novel, The Last Unicorn, which is also a real treasure and was made into a lovely animated movie in the early eighties. Um, as far as movies about ghosts go, my favorite from among that list of 10, which you can find on my website, is a movie called The Eclipse. Uh, it's an Irish movie directed by Connor McPherson. It came out in 2009. Um, and it takes place at actually a literary festival in Ireland. And there is an escort at the festival who is responsible for driving certain authors around, played by Karen Hines. Um, this character has lost his wife before the movie begins. And he begins to see visions of her, realizes that he's being haunted by her. This is at a moment when he, is, he finally has the opportunity to move beyond some of his grief and discover a new love for himself. And he sees these visions and they're very frightening. And he has the sense that his wife is haunting him and forbidding him from moving forward. And I'm just gonna spoil the movie for you, I'm afraid, but I, it, well, Susan is shaking her head no. Okay, that's not how things unfold. Like it's telling a different story than you imagine it's telling. Um, as far as my books of very short stories, uh, among the books by Americans, uh, there is, I guess, let me tell you about one that I read fairly recently. It's called The Afflictions. Uh, it's by uh, an Indian writer now resident in Philadelphia who writes in English named Vikram Peralkar. Um, and this is a book in which uh, there is a gentleman who is being invited into sort of the library society of people who keep track of diseases. Uh, and he tours this library over the course of the book. And we're presented with many very short stories about the fantastic diseases with which the library is presenting him. Um, it's a beautiful, weird, and slightly macabre book. Um, and you can find uh, 19 other works of very short fiction that I also love, like on the list that's on that web page. Well, I can't wait to go for it, and I'm going to read all of them. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't let you get on to reading your mother's favorite okay. story. Okay. Um, so the, uh, this is the second to last story I want to read to you. Um, and uh, it is not frightening like the last story I read. Uh, it's number 54 in the book, and it's called Bouquet. 
She knew that when he died, his voice would die along with him. Yet somehow she had failed to recognize that his scent would die too. Oh, it lingered for a few months in the clothes he left behind, but then it shrank away and she had yet another extinction to mourn. One afternoon though, as she stood in the kitchen unbagging the groceries, it reappeared. The unmistakable incense of his body, earthy and sweet, like the flat spice of modeling clay. It rose up powerfully around her, womb, like that. For an instant, before the facts of her life overtook her, she expected to see him fossicking around in the cabinets again for a jar of peanuts or a bag of chips. Foolishness, so much foolishness. She turned back to the refrigerator transferring the last of the eggs to the egg cradle. That night though, as she lay drifting off to sleep, she detected his fragrance once again. In her delirium, she was convinced that he was bending his limbs into their bed, trying to arrange himself under the covers without disturbing her. But her awareness was no more than the thinnest haze, and soon not even that. And when she woke the next day, she remembered only a small tickle of scent in her nose and a brief feeling of familiar warmth. In the morning, it happened twice more. First, while she was checking the news on her laptop, and then while she was brushing her teeth. And then, once more, a couple of hours later, when she went to the door to sign for a package. Over the next few days, the same dense mixture of aromas found her again and again. Time after time, in one room or another, something in the air would shift and a great exhalation of fragrance would engulf her. She concluded that it was his ghost. He couldn't talk to her, couldn't make himself visible. But from the other side of death, he could offer his bouquet of chemicals. That scent which had accompanied him through a hundred thousand doors into a lifetime of business meetings and dinner parties. Each burst of it, a sign that he still existed and not only existed, but existed nearby. She began to resent the wool musk of the carpet, the sweet leather smell of the couch, to ignore them took the dedication of a penitent. Ignore them though she did. He had found a way to communicate with her and she wanted to communicate with him in return. When he was alive, he used to tuck his face into the dip where her neck met her collarbone, breathing in the jasmine and vanilla of her perfume, the bergamot of her body lotion the bell pepper tang of her sweat. The solution seemed obvious. The next time she noticed his presence, she stood in front of the box fan and let it carry her aroma into the air. For the next 11 years, until she died and he took her away, that was how they spoke to each other. Her scent and his scent making the scent of them together. And then one last story to read to you, uh, which was the, son, the story that Susan requested. Uh, and it is number 14 in the book, it's called Elephants. Um, this is a story that I also read at a previous book festival. Um, I don't know if Gail San Martino is in the, the crowd today, but if she is, uh, I think that she said that this was her favorite story. Um, probably that I had ever presented. Uh, so uh, Susan and Gail, this one is for you. Uh, elephants. A pachydermologist was studying the vocalizations of African elephants. One day, listening to his latest field recordings, 
He looked up to find that just a few meters beyond the camp's cluster of canvas tents, where the yellow dirt was stitched to the yellow grass, the entire herd had gathered as if for a performance. He pressed the pause button on his stereo. All at once, the elephants bustled with activity, tilting their heads, shouldering each other, and pendulating their trunks and tails. He pressed play, and immediately they froze again, training their ears this way and that. How curious, the pachydermologist thought. Over the next hour, he repeated the experiment a dozen times, always to the same result. Pause and then play, pause and then play. Whenever the stereo was operating, the herd silenced itself. As soon as it ceased, they broke their repose. Moreover, he realized, their attention gravitated to a different elephant or set of elephants after each playback, depending on which set of rumbles, snorts, and trumpets had emerged from the speakers. How they seemed to be asking each other, did you do that? Here you are, yet I heard you over there. How can you be calling from two places at once? Even to a bone-born behaviorist such as he, the conclusion was obvious. The members of the herd were capable not only of identifying individual voices, this much was already established science, but of identifying them from recordings. The question then became, were they able to distinguish the original voices, the live voices, from the reproductions? Several weeks of additional observation brought the pachydermologist no closer to an answer. Out of curiosity, he devised a test. From his catalog, he retrieved an old recording, the bonding calls of a matriarch who had been killed for her ivory some six months earlier. He concealed the speakers in an area of brush and thorn, then retreated to a safe distance and activated the remote control. The elephants roared excitedly trampling across the savanna. Every so often they halted to lift their trunks and reposition their ears, their enormous bodies moving as one as they attempted to sound out the matriarch's hiding place. Even after the calls stopped, the herd continued to search for her. For days, her oldest daughter would not eat or drink. She stood on the dry bank of the creek, showering herself woefully with dust. Years later, when asked at a lecture to name his biggest professional regret, the pachydermologist remained too ashamed by this incident to recount it. For the elephants, though, it became the founding tale in a new age of ghost stories. Listen, my children, to a chronicle of wonder and sorrow. The ghost who hid in high grass. The ghost who hissed like seven snakes. The ghost who came back and left again. All right. Um, so uh, now it's time for additional questions. We haven't had many. We have some additional requests for stories to read, but we're almost out of time. We've got about 15 minutes left. I was going to, that story, I, I was, I had to get a Kleenex. It was making me teary. Um, that story and another one of your stories entitled Countless Strange Couplings and Situations. That story, had a phrase in it, willful and premeditated materiality, that I kind of think is to contemplate both it and its opposite is the crux of your book. And I wondered if you'd like 
to comment on that. I think I think you're on to something important. Um, Okay, so I, I wanted to take a look at this story to remember um, <laughs> the premise. Uh, this begins with the sentence, they made him leave the afterworld when they found out he was not a ghost. Um, he's indignant about that. He would much rather be a ghost. He can't believe they kicked him out. How dare they? <laughs> um, uh, in many ways, um, it, several years ago at the festival, um, I was on a panel with the fiction writer Adam Ehrlich Sachs. He's a wonderful writer. And he talked about this idea that Faulkner had uh, mentioned in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech that great literature was always about the human heart in conflict with itself. Um, what Adam said in response to this was that his book on the contrary was really about the human brain in conflict with itself. And I heard Adam say that and I thought, you know, there must be a way of adapting that phrasing to the mission I gave myself with this particular book. Um, and I was never entirely pleased with anything I was able to come up with. But the best I've been able to do is that this is in many ways a book about human being in conflict with itself, um, which is not to say human beings as we would traditionally use the phrase. Uh, what I mean is that there's a part of us that addresses itself to being and a part of us that addresses itself to non-being. Um, and there's always a tension and a back and forth between those two. And many of the stories in this book are about exactly that tension or about that back and forth. Um, it feels to me as if it's a fundamental aspect of what it's like to exist and very rarely do fiction writers orient their books around that sensation. Um, it's hard to know quite what to do with it, um, but it feels to me like a universal human experience uh, to feel that you're being pulled in two directions, toward existence and toward non-existence simultaneously. And a lot of the stories in the book are about exactly that. Well, we've just got a swath of questions. Okay. Um, what's your favorite story in this book? Hmm. Um, my own favorite story in this book. So there are a hundred of them. Um, and I've got a handful that I've resorted to uh, at readings uh, when I wanted to present the book in its best guise. Um, I do think Elephants is one of the strongest stories in the book. Uh, Susan and Gail, you're not the only people who've told me that. Um, the last story in the book is called The Most Terrifying Ghost Story Ever Written. Um, and it's not actually a frightening story. It's sort of a, a dry, sort of wry story. Um, I like that one a lot. Uh, and it sort of feels to me like the book in its most Borgesian aspect. Um, there's a story in the book called Knees, uh, which is one of, I think, well, I've read that one and been told that it was a horrifying story, but it seems to me to be a sweet story, um, a sentimental story, which is kind of why I like that one. Um, as far as the scary stories go, there's one called Parakeets uh, that I think has a very nice effect. Um, and Nathan mentioned that the Q&A, well, it does seem to be working, but I think there are also some questions in the chat. So Susan, wherever love. you find them. There, um, a lot of them are asking about how the book is organized, and that was actually going to be one of my questions. You've organized it in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven chapters memory, fortune, nature, time, speculation, vision, other senses, belief, love, and friendship, family, words, and numbers. But at the back of the book, you provide a concordance if in case anybody is looking at, but, oh, what about ghosts and animals? Or mm. what about ghosts and plants? What about ghosts and family? What about ghosts and imbalance? Um, and I thought the concordance was both hysterical and helpful all at the same time. Thank you. Ghost, ghosts and heartbreak. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of those. Ghosts in the lucky, ghosts in the unlucky. And, unlucky. and there are about four times as many unlucky ghosts in the book as there are lucky ghosts. That's true. And one of the last 
concordance entries is ghosts and that feeling you get in your 30s and 40s and occasionally even into your 50s that you were lost in a boat at sea and the storm is making waves as tall as houses and you are just waiting for the boards to come apart. And though sometimes the storm might subside and the water suddenly seems like glass to you, and maybe that is a little better, you are still in the middle of the ocean after all, and you don't seem to be going anywhere. And the only solution that actually occurs to you is to take out a gun and blow a hole in the bottom of the boat. Yes. 2020 is the year yeah. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the creepiest stories to me was the I like your shoes. Okay. Um, I can tell you, well, do you have a, do you want me to just die? Well, in? I, I was just gonna, it, it's about a woman who finds written on her, on the outside of her windows, the words, I like your shoes. And as a shoeaholic, um, I, I of course was drawn to that, but it ended up being much creepier in a ghostly sense and mm. much creepier in a social sense as well. Yeah, so she discovers this message written in the condensation on her window at the beginning of the story and quickly realizes that it's not written on the inside. It's written on the outside. She lives on the high floor of a skyscraper. And so it can't. she can't figure out how it appeared there. From that moment forward and for the rest of her life, she begins seeing this message on the outside of various windows. Um, and she doesn't know what the emotional valence or the social valence of the message is. She begins to wonder if whatever or whoever is leaving her this message is not in fact complimenting her, but insulting her, teasing her, the way that junior high girls might say, I like your shoes, when what they actually mean are those shoes are hideous. Um, this was a story that, first of all, it's of all the stories in the book, it's the one that's been the most widely read already. Uh, it appeared in the New Yorker a couple summers ago. Um, so there are people who've laid their eyes on this particular story. Um, in addition to that, when I was writing the book, in the middle of writing, trying to figure out how to write a hundred stories uh, as a way of inspiring myself toward new ideas, I uh, borrowed the titles of each of the stories from my first two story collections, Things That Fall From the Sky and The View From the Seventh Layer, and just pinned them to the top of 24 pages uh, to see what they would provoke. This was one of the stories that came out of that exercise. Uh, there was a story in my first collection called The Light Through the Window. I endowed a page with that title, um, and it ended up producing this story which is about a message that is transmitted through a window. And I don't know that I've ever mentioned this before, but there's actually like, there's a, like a, a personal connection to the phrase, I like your shoes and the story from which this story erupted, um, which was something I wrote when I was in my MFA program at the University of Iowa. Uh, and one of my classmates, this is a story about a window cleaner who is flirting with a woman on the other side of the glass um, by leaving her messages on the outside. Um, and one of the women in my class thought that this was very creepy and she didn't understand why the messages he was leaving um, were so high toned either. And you know, why wouldn't she just say, he, why wouldn't he just say something ordinary like I like your shoes um, that was the phrase she suggested. And so that was the phrase that I borrowed for this story. Um, and I don't know if she has encountered the book yet or whether she realizes that I've uh, kind of held on to this phrase for so many years. I'm so glad you did. We have a very interesting question. We tend to think of ghosts as figments of imagination and that's what fiction is too. Do you see a relationship? Um, well, for me, at least, ghosts occupy uh, a fictive territory. Um, I've never had an encounter with a ghost. Um, I'd like to, <laughs> I'm open to it, uh, but I never have. Um, where I've encountered my ghosts and where I've encountered my feeling of the numinous or the supernatural 
is inside narratives, inside stories, inside books. Uh, so for me, they do occupy a very similar space. Um, a lot of the magic of the world filters into me through the books I read. Uh, it's kind of at the center of my life, um, books and literature, or at least the books and literature I love best. Are you an only child? I'm an older brother. Older brother. Yes. I'm, I'm an only child who moved a lot, so books were my constant companion, as I had no friends. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked what the name of that die was. Uh, it is a Zaki Hedron, uh, spelled Z-O-C-C-H-I-H-E-D-R-O-N. The inventor was, I don't know his first name, but we will call him Luigi, Luigi Zaki, something like that. Uh, and so he named it after himself. It's not the only hundred-sided die you can find, um, but it's a beautiful little object and it actually works better. You know, you can rig up a hundred sided, sided die with just two 10 sided die if you want to. Um, but of all the hundred sided dies I've encountered, this is the one that actually, it seems to me to be the most functional. Um, most hundred sided dies are just spheres. And if you're not careful, you're not gonna be able to keep hold of them. Uh, but this one works quite well. You'll roll off the end of the skirt. Yep. Um, a lot of people have asked about dreams. Do ideas for your stories come from dreams, perhaps? Very infrequently. But in the case of this particular book, there's one story that emerged directly from a dream. This almost never happens to me. Um, there's sort of an idea about writers that we wake up in the middle of the night having dreamt something and jot it down. And that's where we find our inspiration. Maybe that's true for some people, but it's never been true for me. Um, and I think that's because I, as a practical matter, um, I don't write in stories, I write in sentences. And it's very hard to dream a string of sentences. But there's a story in this book, it's number 66, it's called 666. And it's the devil story in the book. <laughs> and I woke up from a dream knowing the entire shape of that story, and also knowing what the first few sentences would be, word for word, and what the last few sentences would be, word for word. And because these were all such short stories, I was able to retain that information in my head and actually do something with it. Um, the only other time I feel that I've dreamed a story, it was one that I couldn't retain, and it wasn't actually one of my own. Um, my favorite writer is the Italian novelist Italo Calvino. I've read everything he wrote that's been published in English, which is all of his major work, at least. Um, one night I had a dream that I was reading the newly discovered Calvino novel. And in this dream, I read it the way I read in real life, which is to say, as a long series of sentences whose insinuations were speaking to each other and whose rhythms dictated the sentences surrounding them. This is how I think a lot of writers approach prose. Um, because I wasn't experiencing the book in the dream as a narrative, but as a 200 page sequence of sentences, I was convinced when I woke up that I had actually written an entire Calvino book in my dream. And I wished desperately that I had been able to transcribe it and jot it down, uh, but I couldn't. It was just gone to the dream world. Um, but it's one of the best dreams I've ever had in my life. <laughs> oh, that's marvelous. Well, I think on that lovely note, we should close for the evening. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, this has just been a very special e event for me. I can't thank you enough, Kevin, for your beautiful, beautiful book, and I urge everyone to head to Wordsworth's tomorrow to buy it. You said they had already 50 pre-orders. They had, I think, 50 pre-orders, signed copies. And so I should say to anyone who's listening, either from Central Arkansas or elsewhere, um, the easiest way to get a signed or signed and inscribed copy of this book is to do it through Wordsworth. Uh, just contact them either online or by phone or in person. Uh, let them know what you want. 
And it's my hometown bookstore. I'm in there all the time. So all they have to do is give me a call and I can stop by the store and sign the book for you or inscribe it for you. If you live out of the state or out of the city, they can even ship it to whatever address you'd like to see it shipped to. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Susan, for doing this with me. And thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I'm gonna hold up the book just so that you can see its beautiful cover. Love the cover. Me too. Um, so I'm grateful, thank you. Thank you, good night. Good night. <laughs>